Uh, we exchange some words and then I tell him, promise I won't do that more than two more times today. And then he laughs. So we're at war, we're going at it, trying to get in his head a little bit. What up y'all? I am headed to South Florida to play the WPT $3,500 main event. This is the first major series that's putting on events since COVID started. It's gonna be at the Hard Rock, one of my favorite places to play. And I'm pretty stoked. Haven't played a major event since February 2020. So it's gonna be interesting to see what it's like on tour for the first tournament. I'm used to saying hi to people in the hallways, chatting with people at the table. It's just, it's gonna be weird, it's gonna be different. So I'm not really sure what to expect and uh, we'll experience it together. In the meantime, uh, make sure you guys hit the subscribe and notification button so you know about future vlogs that I put out. And let's head to Florida, folks. And Hard Rock is super diligent about uh, their COVID procedures. They're probably one of the best in uh, the nation. That's what I've been hearing from a lot of my friends who have already played there as well. Airport nice and empty, just the way I like it. All right, you're all set up, ready to go. It's a pretty good spot to stay if you don't want to end up having to eat out all the time. And staying in a place with a fridge and a little kitchenette like this is gonna make a huge difference being able to stop at the grocery store and at least have, you know, two out of three of your meals uh, at home every day. This is actually super important for me to have a nice comfy space because I still do my coaching while I'm on the road. I still grind on Sundays. I always make sure I check out the pictures and see that we got a decent setup for the grind station. Y'all who still work part-time or full-time or run your own business, I'm sure it's gonna be super key for you as well. Uh, we gotta turn off these lights. We got a sick view of the guitar here. That is the hard rock, folks. Damn it. No forks or spoons. And I'm too lazy to go back downstairs. Bon appetit. Um, last night I was eating my soup using this big ass spoon and this uh, glass bowl because I didn't know where the utensils were. I thought maybe you had to call down for them. And it turns out I did call and all the cutlery and plateware and all that stuff were just sitting here in the dishwasher. It was late and no one was picking up or I guess I waited like two minutes and I was too lazy and tired so just said screw it and started eating with the spoon but now I know why. We're gonna need some more work. We need a... Nah, that's not dangerous yet. And we are out of the 1100, bullet number one. Got to show up pretty early. Down to like eight big blinds, double up with aces, then raise king nine suited, flop the nine. About three ways in the flop on a nine, six, four. Got turned to seven. Just gave him a set of sevens and he busted me. Break starting pretty soon, so I'm gonna wait till I end the break, get a nice little chai latte, and then get back in the game. It's only one re-entry today. Got a pretty good field, probably gonna get over 400 players or something for this 1100. But yeah, right back at it, let's do it. And we are out of the 1K 1100. Uh, 100k guarantee two bullets literally literally could not get anything going today 
Uh, started with 20K starting stack, which is downhill, downhill, downhill. Busted, re-entered, just literally couldn't win a pot. So sometimes it goes like that. Tomorrow it's a $2,200 buy-in, 200K guarantee. That's unlimited re-entry. And then the next day is 3,500 main event. And then after that, we got the 5K. So bigger stuff coming up. Uh, gonna go back home, take care of some errands, get things off my plate so that we are in the zone for the rest of the week. New York All-Stars Barbershop. Finally got a haircut. And there is a Whole Foods right next door. And we got a kitchen, so time to get some groceries. Damn, that's tempting. Can't say no to that. I mean, it's the ultimate cookie bar. Okay, we're getting two of them. Sold. go stocked up a little bit so common question i get is just how the hell do you not get worn out being on the road i get sick of it after a few weeks and part of this way this lifestyle the way i'm setting it up this is how i make it work that allows me to live kind of a normal ish healthy life i do like to ball out sometimes and go to nice restaurants or go stay a super nice hotel i'll stay at the hard rock but other times i try to balance it out so i try to pick you know, which are my trips where I really want to have a more luxurious experience and which are my trips where it doesn't really matter and I'm just really focused on grinding or maximizing my profit. It's also kind of an investment for me. The more I do this uh, now, then on future trips with my wife, with my kids, um, with my friends, I get to choose to live a little more luxurious lifestyle. We're going to be joining my wife and my son for dinner. This is something I always tell people who talk about how long distance relationships are too hard, you can't do them, blah, blah, blah. Not that we're necessarily having a long distance relationship because my wife traveled with me on the road, but there are times that, yeah, you do have to do long distance or it's just more optimal for whatever reason. The thing I always tell people is freaking video chat all the time with your significant other. It's awesome that we can do that. It just makes you feel more connected and it makes you just feel like you're hanging out there with the other person. So, hello, what's up? is the morning of the 2k side event 200k guarantee i woke up a little late so i gotta eat some quick and that's why i bought some stuff that's gonna be nice and quick to eat so chicken salad uh we'll do some berries and uh maybe i'll have a couple shrimps some vegetables in me as well bon appetit hotel room got knocked out of the 2k side event today really didn't get much going at all just fired one bullet i was ready to go for two but uh late registration had already closed by the time i busted i was down to like 7k from the uh, 20k starting stack when the registration closed and it was the eighth level and i was uh, sitting at about eight big blinds or so and it's obviously super tempting to just shove all in so that you could bust and go re-enter to get a fresh 20k starting stack but you really shouldn't go too crazy with that strategy because that 7 8k in trips is still worth a decent amount 20k is worth 2k then you have about a third of that so it's it's six seven hundred dollars that you're just burning lighting on fire if you do that i might take some a little thinner spots or maybe even a break-even spot because of that, but you're also increasing your um, your buy-ins for the trip. You're, in general, you want a lower variance. You don't want to increase variance. So I wouldn't go too crazy with that. Don't light money on fire. I, I did try to play really fast when there was about two minutes left and I had that eight, nine big blind stack trying to remind the dealer that, hey, you know, this is the last time to re-enter. I was telling the other players so that I could help speed up the game. And I think I did help two extra hands go in. And people probably, you know, they were kind of laughing and like, 
probably assuming that I'm ready to just jam it in super light, uh, which I wanted them to think that because uh, I wasn't. So if anything, they might just call me a little looser. So it's always okay to kind of give away something like that as long as you're aware of what the others are thinking and you adapt appropriately. On break here at the Hard Rock main event, second break. We were down to 20,000 from 40,000 stars stack. Got aces, had a nice little hand over there. I summon raised from middle position. I three bet my aces on the cutoff. The button cold calls me, other guy calls. Flop comes six, three, three. First guy checks, I check. And the guy on the button, uh, I was trying to get him to bet maybe a pair or something like that. So I have to check raise him, but he checked it back. Turn comes to king. And I decided to check again. Maybe you hit the king. I'll get a check raise in here. And he does bet on the king. He bet like 600, like a third of the pot. And I raise it to 2,000. And then he re-raises me to 5,400. And I was like, what is he representing? I mean, there's no way he's got kings here and flatted pre-flop. It's possible, but I don't think so. I was like, maybe he was slow playing a set of sixes on the flop, maybe a three. So I kind of felt like he might be overplaying something like ace king. So I was tempted to raise back, but I decided just to call to be safe. River comes a jack, a check, now we're at 6,500. Again, I was tempted to raise, but uh, decided to just call. You know, I might be paranoid with uh, with the three in his hand. So I just called and he ended up having king jack for top two pair, but his two pair was counterfeited. Uh, my ace is still held up there. So that pot got me back over 30,000. So sitting uh, slightly below the uh, average stack, which is probably about 45,000 now. Dinner break here at the Hard Rock 3500 WPT main event. Uh, pretty peaceful environment here. A lot of people chilling. Um, obviously, can't go socialize or at least chose not to. Found a pretty cool spot to just chill and uh, meditate, stretch. You're so on the entire day that uh, it's nice to kind of just have a little bit of wind down time out here before you uh, get back to war. No, we are back at the apart hotel. Not where we want to be, which means we busted out of day 1A. That's the bad news. The good news is there's still a day 1B. We only used one bullet today. We got knocked out after late reg was closed. I had King Jack in hijack under the gun, plus one, eight handed opened to about 2K. I three bet to about 5,500 with King Jack off. That's a hand where it's not really good enough to flat. There's a lot of players behind us who might squeeze. He was opening a little bit wide and he was kind of a passive player post flop. Felt like it was fine for him to play the hand, but if I play behind the hand, a lot of people might squeeze behind me, which is why it plays better as a three bet. So I put in the three bet, the flop comes jack eight and another small card with uh, two clubs. I did not have a club in my hand. So I went ahead and C bet five there. It's a slightly bigger C bet. Uh, I really just wanted to start getting all the chips in there. It's a pretty vulnerable board. Queen, an eight, a club are all gonna be very bad for me. And he didn't seem like the type of player that's gonna check raise very much. So sometimes you wanna bet smaller to induce the check raise. I didn't think he was gonna do that, which is why I kind of wanted to start pumping up the pot now. He calls, the turn comes in eight. So there's two eights on the board now. And then he leads 12K. And he really, it really felt like he was genuinely just thinking if he should lead on the eight or not. Like he knew it was kind of like a, a good card for him to lead. And he was like thinking about it, but he didn't seem very confident in if he should do it or not. That's at least was my read. So he leads 12K and I mean, I'm definitely not folding. There's just too many bluffs out there. And uh, especially with that read. And uh, I decided to shove because if I call, I literally only have about half the pot remaining. And there's so many bad river cards. I just wanted to jam it in to protect my hand for all the draws he could possibly have, or even just cards he'll be able to bluff. And I even figured he might call me with the worst jack. 
because Ace Jack might check raise in that flop. Again, he's kind of on the passive side, so maybe not. But I still do beat hands like uh, 10 Jack, uh, 9 Jack suited, uh, Jack Queen suited. So uh, I jammed it in, and then he was tanking, and he looked like he was in a little bit of pain while he was thinking. Usually in that spot, they either have it or they don't. So the fact that he bets and now he's thinking for such little more, I was like, Shit. like does he actually maybe have a better hand than me or does he just have a 10 jack jack queen? So I got pretty tempted to maybe try to talk him into a fold because I was like, shoot, maybe he's sitting here with ace jack. But I wasn't really sure if I wanted him to call or not. So I just kind of kept my mouth shut and he finally called and he had pocket queens. That's what you call a knit roll. Never heard of knit roll. It's when someone quote unquote slow rolls you, but they're not really trying to slow roll you. They're undervaluing their hand so much that they think about it so much because queens is a snap call there. He probably should even be check raising the flop. So at least my read was right that it was going to be a pretty passive player. Do I like the way he played the hand? Yeah, pretty much. I don't, I don't see much I could do different besides maybe fold pre-flop. But like I said, he was opening a bit too much and passive post-flop. So I, I think I'm pretty happy with my play. I would do the same thing in the future. Maybe the only thing I would do different is go with my instinct and try to talk him into folding. But that's, that's really nitpicking. I always write down every single spot I'm unsure of. Uh, on my phone in a notepad and then when I get free time later in the week I'll review them or tonight I got a couple hours so I'm gonna review them so I feel good about those spots and come back in confident tomorrow. The feel today is ridiculous. It looks like it's gonna hit almost 700 players on day 1A and it usually gets more players in day 1B. I think it's gonna be like two times bigger than last year's field and it's gonna beat the guarantee by at least three times. It was a million dollar guarantee. It's probably gonna be over three million price pool, maybe even four million. So pretty sick turnout, not surprising at all because a lot of the card rooms and casinos all over the US are closed. So people are jamming themselves into wherever the hell there is that's gonna host a tournament. I had friends who told me they had someone at their table from Missouri who's like, I've never traveled for poker. I've never left my state to go play poker, but there's nowhere for me to play, so uh, I'm here. And I think there's a lot of people here like that probably pretty good for the hard rock and anywhere that is um, hosting tournaments that they're gonna get some new clientele and who knows maybe when things are back to normal they realize that a good time coming to these events and hopefully they keep coming and we could see uh, some new players at these events so um yeah pr pretty good turnout i'm glad i'm here day 1b baby let's do it one more chance one more chance to make it happen Finally having a good day one session. We have a little, almost double the average. Just been playing a bunch of huge pots, check raising a lot of opponents. I've been uh, four betting, limp raising, and people are just starting to realize that if they're gonna get in the pots with me, they're gonna have to play huge pots and they're gonna have to play for their stack. Same time, uh, there's another guy, and this also happens where uh, they don't give a and they actually try to go for you because they see you running off the table. So they feel like they gotta, they gotta stop you. So I have a guy doing that who's, who's not a professional. So generally uh, when people try to do that, it usually works out in my favor. I actually it just got bluffed by a player who was actually doing that against me. So I raise a six of spades, middle position, both the blinds called. The flop was nine, six, four. So I have a second pair top kicker. Checks to me, I go ahead and see that. Small blind folds, big blind calls. Turn comes another nine. There is a flush draw on the flop. I decide to double barrel. I think my hand's just good often enough. I do want to have some sixes in my range. I do get to charge some flush draws. He also just has some float sometimes. So uh, double barrel, and then he check raised me on the turn. So I bet about 6,500 on the turn into 9K pot. So about 65% on the pot. And he check raised me to 15K. I didn't necessarily buy that he was going to do that with the nine. I could definitely have a boat here. Definitely can check raise his nines and definitely should some of his better ones. But I do block ace nine. Felt suspicious. This was definitely a player that I had a feeling might be willing to play back, but I wasn't really sure. So I called River come basically a blank. And obviously he could have had um, some straight draws that he decided to check raise with, but just my instinct wasn't that he would do that with straight draws. So I wasn't super worried about straight getting there. But uh, nonetheless, he tanked for a while and then fired out another 16k. And I tanked for a bit and finally folded. 
and he showed the queen eight with the queen of hearts. Definitely worked. Um, I don't like his play, but again, if I don't have info on the player and I don't know what he's capable of, um, I might make some incorrect folds versus them until I get that info. He probably prefers not to have the heart in his hand, uh, especially when he's betting that size because he might be targeting just getting me off my flush draws at missed, which I definitely would call check raise with. So he doesn't want to have that queen of hearts in his hand. So that's a spot where I probably normally would consider calling GTO wise, but I decided to make an exploitative fold and um, you know, it kicked me in the ass. So happens sometimes, you gotta realize you're not gonna make every perfect decision. He, he showed the bluff, so he wants to go to war and uh, I love going to war and I got a big stack. So uh, maybe we'll get in some interesting pots with this guy again. Get my YouTube clips right here. You're all, hey, you also like Yeah, That's I am. Good morning, I'm making my YouTube video right now. Yeah. Hey, uh, hey, what's up? Hey, what's up on Satellite going winner? On? Satellite winner? Yes. Uh, you're gonna win that? You gotta get in a tournament first. Big I gotta bring the cup home to Louisiana. All right, <laughs> we're gonna see this guy heads up. Two days. We are on a 15 minute break. Just had a pretty active level these last two hours. I uh, got to the table, played my uh, first hand, won the pot. Very next hand, I opened. King 10 off, for red King 10 for middle position. The big blind calls, our buddy who bluffed us with the queen eight. Flop comes, seven for three with two spades. I see bet uh, about 1300, which is a third of the pot. He check raises to 3500 and I snapped it out 10K. And he tanks for a bit and folds. And I show the King 10 and I'm like, got your back, buddy. We exchange some words and then I say, I promise I won't do that more than two more times today. And then he laughs. Yeah, so we're at war, we're going at it, trying to get in his head a little bit. Generally, I would recommend for you not to pick battles and not to try to go at it versus specific people because that's how you really get off your game if you try to focus on one individual person. But uh, hey, I like to take it to the streets and go to war. That's just my style. We're supposed to have two more levels left for the day, but they added a level because the field is so big and they're worried they're not going to get through the entire tournament in the four days we have available to finish the tournament. So they added an extra hour. Good move by them. That's much better than playing till like 5 a.m. on the very last day. No one likes that. We're going to get back in there. Um, it's a long day. I brought some peppermint tea or something to uh, keep me calm, relaxed and stimulated. Let's get back in there and uh, finish the day off strong. <laughs> Holy crap, what a swingy day. Finish with 91.5K. I'm guessing that's gonna be right around average. Uh, maybe a little bit higher, because I think we lost around half the field. Just gonna try to wind down, get straight to sleep. We're out. We are out. We are out of the main event, did not make it through on day two. I had pocket sixes in the big blind, hijacked open um, to 4,500 at 2K big blind. The button opened who had a huge stack. He's a, a long time reg who's very, very loose. So I believe he's uh, flying extremely wide there. Uh, small blind also called and then we're in the big blind with 25 big blinds pocket sixes, I decided to jam it. So the main thing to be thinking about there is you don't just wanna go crazy with all your pairs because you don't have a ton of fold equity when there's that much dead money in the pot. So small pairs might call your jam and there's a decent chance of getting um, called by a bigger pair, uh, pocket eights, sevens and whatnot. Um, even pocket fives may call you. So that's why you don't want to go too crazy with stuff like douches, threes, and fours there. But I felt like pocket sixes was probably right on the border of where I do want to still jam it. So I went ahead and slammed it in. First guy had tens, uh, unfortunately. So knocked us out of the tournament. Uh, whenever I have a spot like that, that's somewhat close. I do like to double check it. So I just came back to my computer when I got home and plugged it into Hold'em Resources Calculator. And I gave the opener this opening range here from the hijack, opening about 22.5% of the hands. I gave the button this 
fairly wide sliding range. Honestly, he's, he, I think he's capable of sliding way wider than this. Of course, I took out some of the hands. I think he's three bedding. And here is the final output of what I can be profitably shoving. And as you can see, pocket sixes is an easy jam there. Pocket fives is getting close. I could also jam all these kind of suited Broadway stuff. Ace Jack plus, King Queen is pretty on the fence, could go either way. So that was nice to get some confirmation that my jam was right. That said, it's Sunday. That means we can still jump in some online tournaments. Busted pretty early, so most of the tournaments are still available for registration. So I'm gonna quickly just kind of get set up, get comfortable and do a Sunday grind sesh. That's always, I can't sit there and get all mopey about my bust out. Uh, there's other great tournaments to play. I gotta stay on the grind, gotta stay on the hustle. Sundays are big days. There's a lot of money to be made. I usually have at least 10K in buy-ins on Sundays. It's definitely no joke. A big part of my poker income comes from just being focused and playing Sundays week in, week out, and rarely miss a Sunday throughout the whole year. Even on my honeymoon, I played uh, Sundays, which my wife is very cool with. Uh, that said, I'm gonna go get set up and get ready to get on this online grind. Getting ready to head out of here. We got our flight back to San Jose, California. Basically bricked this trip completely. 0 for 6 on the bullets, 0 for 4 in the tournaments. We're in for about just under 20K, so maybe 18K or so. It may seem like a big loss, but again, it's best to think about it in terms of buy-ins. Lost six tournaments, that's not really very much. If I would have just cashed one out of those six tournaments, that's already around a 15% cash rate, a little higher. The average cash rate for players is gonna be right around that 14 to 16%, and for the better players around 16 to 20% or so. With variance, it's really not that crazy. I could come back for the next series of some of tournament and cash two out of six events, and all of a sudden, I'm running about even, about average. Important to not get too caught up in short-term results. Just imagine on a Sunday, I go and play 25 tournaments. You just gotta be focused on how you play. If you have a tough time dealing with downswings after a trip like this, check out my video, how to deal with downswings like a boss. And make sure you guys hit the subscribe button and the notification button so that you know the next time I'm putting out more content like this if you wanna follow along. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace out, I'm heading back to Cali.